guy. Yeah, it's a good demo. Don't give him the discount. <laughs> theme of the book. It's amazing how uh, growing up in uh, so-called Muslim countries, they, uh, they breed fanaticism into you. And uh, I'm going to use Adip again as an example. Uh, Adip is a very enlightened Muslim, very, very, uh, is definitely guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And only two weeks ago, only two weeks ago, he came to me and made a confession. He said, <laughs> I, I used to think until this morning, that no Jew or Christian can make it to heaven. This is how we, 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 were, we were taught. But now, Alhamdulillah, I believe, I, I'm now convinced of this verse in the Quran, that there are righteous Christians and righteous uh, Jews and righteous Muslims who are dedicated to God alone. Of course, uh, there are other verses in the Quran also that confirm this, like uh, 3113, I think, that says, uh, among the Jews and the Christians, there are those who are righteous and will make it to heaven. Okay, that's the theme of the book, and it is very important. So we're going to skip uh, this, the copyright page. And the other title page. I want to read the acknowledgement. The grateful acknowledgement is made to Lisa Spray for her tireless work in editing and helping in this, the production of this monu monumentous, momentous and historical project. And she worked days and nights on this, as you know, and Congratulate her for all the credit she accumulated. Significant editorial assistance was also provided by Edith Yuxef, Lydia Kelly, Matuta Jasoma, Susan Harrison, and Emily Stern, for which I'm thankful. Of course, God is the one who rewards all these people, and in, uh, in many different senses, every one of you contributed to this book. God knows that, and He will reward you accordingly even though you remain anonymous. The next page says, Pro Proclaiming one religion for all the people. <clears throat> now, sp speaking strictly from uh, an outsider point of view, as uh, one who's looking from the outside, uh, this is uh, one of the most, in fact, it is the main function of the message of the covenant, is to unify, consolidate, all the religions in the world uh, into one. And this is not uh, a bright idea of a human being or a collection of human beings, as I wrote before. This is God's plan, and therefore God will do it. It's not, uh, no human beings, no armies in the whole world can do it. God will do it. And God will prepare the hearts of the new generations of the Christians, the Jews, the Hindus, the Buddhists, and so on, to accept one religion, that is the God religion, and this is why the theme, the theme of the book is, is, uh, is a unifying theme. So proclaiming one religion for all the people, it may not even take two generations. And then you will see this final testament printed with the Old Testament and the New Testament in one book, and you will see people unifying into one major religion, that's God's religion. And by the end of the world, even though this started out to be Satan's kingdom, it's no, God, will, will, God has always been a winner. But as far as this tiny planet Earth is concerned, God's religion will be the winner before the end of the world. So uh, this is the main function, and it is a very important function. And like I said, I'm just looking like, as one looking from the outside. Proclaiming one religion for all the people, the final testament, this final testament consolidates all the messages delivered by all of God's messengers into one global message. Henceforth, there is only one religion that is approved by God. Islam is not a name, it is a description, not a submission to God, worshiping God and devoting the worship absolutely to Him alone. And you can see here the word submission emerging to replace, not replace, it's actually it's the correction of the word, the Arabic word. If we speak in Arabic, we will still say Islam, and we will still say Muslim in Arabic. And this is the way the Quran uses it. But if you speak Japanese, you have to translate the word Islam to the Japanese word for submission. And, if, and the, you, you cannot use the word Muslim when you speak in Japanese. If you cannot speak Japanese, and all of a sudden you utter Arabic. You have to speak Japanese and translate the word Muslim into the Japanese equivalent of submitted. 
So this is the one religion. Total submission to God, worshiping God and devoting the worship absolutely to Him alone. Anyone who meets this criterion is a submitter. The new, the new translation, this is the old translation now. <laughs> the new translation is be submitted. Anyone who meets this criterion is a submitter. Thus, you may be a Muslim Jew, a Muslim Christian, a Muslim Buddhist, a Muslim Hindu, or a Muslim Muslim. And today we were recording it. Today we're recalling the incident in Washington, D.C. That was on the 19th of July, by the way. It was the day I was to speak, I was I spoke to the World Future Society. And Ahsan was sitting at the table with the... Uh, we had the, a Jew, a Protestant, and we needed a Catholic. <laughs> and there was one empty chair with a big round table. And this man came by and he said, Hi, can I join you? And said, not to be the Catholic we needed. And he said, I submit to the one God. I'm a submitter, and the Jew said she's a submitter, and the Protestant said she was a submitter. And they said, we cannot bring ourselves to say I'm a Muslim. But they really meant it. We submit to the one God. Because the Catholics started out by talking about Jesus, and this and that. And they said, Jesus is God, or something like that. And they said, uh, where is it in the Bible? Can you show me in the Bible where it says Jesus is God? You know, the, the Christians have certain verses that their favorites. Like, I'm the way, I'm the life, and the truth. You know, as in the beginning there was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, you know, all these things. I said, okay, well, Jesus may be the way, and the life, and the truth, but the, how, why does he say, I'm God? I'm the way, I'm the life, I'm the truth. But he didn't say, I'm God. He may be the way, the life, the truth, he may be all of this. But show me where he says, I am God. And I show you ten places where he says, I'm not God. Dreadful. Anyway, before the end of the discussion, he did say, I submit to the one God alone. So, uh, we had examples of people saying, uh, we had Muslim Muslims at the table. Afham <laughs> Afham Khalili was there, and Khalili and Hassan also. <coughs> okay, the verse uh, 19 of Surah 3 says, "The only religion acceptable by God is submission." And uh, 85 of Surah 3 says, "Anyone who accepts other than submission as his religion, it will not be accepted from him. He will end up a loser in the hereafter." So as you see, we are already advanced even beyond this new translation. See, I'm reading to you, I'm changing the word, the Arabic word, to the English word, submission. And this is, uh, we should be thankful to God for this, that we're advancing so fast. All religions of the world, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, etc., have been corrupted through idolization of their prophets and saints. This is just a statement of fact. Well, what's happening now? Okay. Now, being advanced, just one second, being advanced, uh, before I forget this thought, uh, I want you to know that uh, maybe maybe only about 50 years from now, uh, they will show your picture, or my picture, or holding a book like this and looking at it, and they'll be laughing at it. They look at, uh, 50 years ago, they used to have things called books, made of paper with ink printed on them, and bulky things. Because 50 years from now, probably we'll be using something like... Uh, small TV, you push the button and the page is small in front of you, or something like that, because the books are kind of uh, uh, primitive, so everything will be advancing. So uh, it is good that we are going at this pace and that to the point that we were ahead of the book that just came out of the press. Adib, what did you want to say? Use the word the Islam, yes. Okay. That's why when I read it, I didn't read it. But uh, as, as I said, this is a translation uh, towards the new translation. So if you want to reserve your copy of the new translation, leave the name of the Islam. <laughs> I'm already working on it. <laughs> okay, now you flip the page and you see some biblical uh, verses. that are predicting the coming of the Prophet Muhammad and the Qur'an. From Deuteronomy 18.15, A prophet like me will the Lord your God raise up for you from among your kinsmen, to him you shall listen. That was Moses. The next verse from uh, also 18, Deuteronomy, is uh, God telling Moses, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their kinsmen, and will put my words into his mouth. He shall tell them all that I command him. 
If any man will not listen to my words, which he speaks in my name, I myself will make him answer for him. So as you see, God is, uh, is uh, I mean, even here in the in Deuteronomy, the accuracy, you can see the accuracy of the language. We are not following Muhammad, we are not following Rashad Khalifa, we are not following any human being. And don't let, don't let anybody tell you that. I, I don't follow Rashad Khalifa, and you don't follow Rashad Khalifa. We follow the words of God. We follow God. When people make those statements, they are making them out of their idol, idolatry. Because they idolize Ali and Muhammad and Hussein and Jesus and Mary and so on. They idolize human beings. We follow the word of God. And if Rasat Khalifa says anything on his own, we don't listen to him. We can listen and use our own discretion. But we follow, we do not follow what Rasat is saying, we follow what God is saying. You and I. So you can see here that God is saying, if any man will not listen to my words, the words of God, which he speaks in my name, the name of God, I myself will make him answer for it. So the idea of messengers is that it's not the messengers at all. If the messengers we know never existed, God will find other people to deliver the message. It is the message that is important. It is the words of God that we follow. And you can see the accuracy of the words even in the translated all the scriptures. The next statement from John 14, 16, 17, Jesus says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another paraclete to be with you always, the spirit of truth. Because the Quran, the last message from God, remember the message, not the messenger, the message came and it will be with us for the end, until the end of the world, this, the Quran. And the Prophet Muhammad was the first one who received it and delivered it. So this verse speaks about the Prophet Muhammad in my opinion. Uh, in 1613, Jesus says, when the spirit of truth comes to you, he will guide you to all truth. As you will see, we're going to read the introduction together, and you will see that the picture is, uh, is being perfected. You meet people now, now in our generation, and they have no idea why we came to this world, what it is all about, where we're going, where we came from. You don't know. And you can feel the privilege that God has given you. Because we have the complete picture, we have the whole truth, and we have it supported by physical evidence. <coughs> when the Spirit of Truth comes to you, He will guide you to all truth and will announce to you the things to come. We've got all the information here, even the end of the world, and when it will, be, when it will take place. And what are the, the signs that remain to be that? In Malachi 3, we see the, uh, uh, which is the last book of the Old Testament, we see a prophecy about the message of the covenant. It says, Lo, I am sending my messenger. So obviously this is God speaking. Lo, I am sending my messenger to prepare the way before me. And suddenly there, there will come to the temple the Lord whom you seek and the messenger of the covenant whom you desire. Yes, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts, which is Rabbil Alameen in Arabic. But who will endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? For he is like the refiner's fire, he will sit purified. Malachi 3, 1, 2, 3. It amazes me, wherever I go, as to uh, the, uh, the pain that the opponents uh, suffer from uh, proclaiming the word of God alone. Otis. Who's Otis? Carolyn, well, I don't know if you know this or not, but Carolyn was telling us when we were in your house the other day that uh, she went in a store and she saw a lady dressed in a Middle Eastern way and she said, Assalamu alaikum. The lady ran to the back of the store and brought her husband. And he came and he said, I guess, uh, Karen was not dressed traditionally in the Middle East. And the wife, this, this woman has no business telling me, Assalamu alaikum, she's not even covering her hair. So the husband came and uh, asked Carolyn, where, uh, when did you become a Muslim? Where did you come from? And she said, I come from Tucson. And uh, I think he said something about crazy Rashad Khalifa. And uh, she said, yes, I know him. 
And then he said, don't mention his name in this neighborhood. Are you familiar with this story, Otis? Oh, okay. Well, Karen will tell us when she comes. She's coming next week, inshallah. But uh, this is what she said. Who was with me when she said that? Yeah, and Gail. I don't know if I told the story like she said it or not, but the, the summary of it is, okay, this guy said, don't mention his name in this neighborhood. And he said in a hostile way, right? Some kind of a threat. And this, uh, it puzzles me, but when I look at these verses from Malachi, uh, that say, yet, uh, but who will endure the day of his coming? Now, God describes the message as a heavy message. In other words, you have to be strong to receive it. And it probably has to do with our, uh, our initial inclination not to uh, accept God's absolute authority. Remember why we are here? The crime is committed. So we can come there, shut the door. Ask to go inside and close all the doors. <laughs> <laughs> we have to build a soundproof room or something. It's just, uh, to me, there is no explanation to this hostility. And of course, we have been experiencing this here with uh, the idol worshippers. However, let's see, uh, it's a statement in the Quran, though, we should not be surprised. I want to, there's a verse here that we, I want you to look at. Somebody assigned to give this for us today? You. Oh. It's too late. <laughs> I want to assign Linda Baroni is going to give the Quranic study next uh, next time, the, a week, two weeks from tonight. So I, I don't want to forget that. Uh, Ahmed will be another time. Linda Baroni. <laughs> Okay, look at Surah 42, verse 13. 42, 1, 3. Forty-two thirteen explains why they are so hostile and why they cannot stand the message of being devoted to God alone. Okay. The subtitle is only one religion, which fits with the theme that we're talking about. He decreed for you the same religion he decreed for Noah, and what we inspire to you. Oh, the kids are still in the kitchen. What did you do? No, send them to the children's room with the babysitter. Close all the doors. Thank He decreed for you the same religion he decreed for Noah and what we inspire to you and what we decreed for Abraham, Moses, and Jesus. You shall uphold this one religion. Do not divide it. Then I inserted the subtitle in the middle of the verse. It says monotheists, that's us, versus idol worshippers. The idol worshippers will resent what you invite them to do. God redeems to himself whomever he wills. He guides to himself everyone who submits. So they resent it. This is why they cannot stand this message of of uh, worshiping God alone and being devoted to God alone. That person who told the Carolyn, don't mention his name in this neighborhood, never saw me, never, never heard me. And uh, there is no reason whatsoever for him to be hostile. He's not even from the Middle East. He's the person who was born here. It has nothing to do with uh, Sunni or whatever. Yet the name... Uh, provokes hostility. But this is what God said in America. In the end of the Quran also, like we read. Now. Okay, now we we'll go to the big criterion. The next page. It says, when God alone is mentioned, the hearts of those who do not believe in the hereafter shrink with aversion. But when others are mentioned besides him, they rejoice. Surah 39, verse 45. This is our criterion to distinguish the people and uh, even ourselves and to show that we believe in the hereafter. If I am averse to the idea of God alone, this tells me that I don't believe in the hereafter. Even even if I say with my lips that I believe in the hereafter. And uh, this criterion is so powerful that uh, the most famous translator of the Quran, Abdullah Yusuf Ali, did not 
bring, could not bring himself to translate it honestly. He did not say when God alone is mentioned. He said when God, the one and only, is mentioned. The one and only does not mean alone at all. The one and only is the same as the great or the, the, the forgiver or the merciful. When, when God the merciful is mentioned, the hearts of those. When God the great is mentioned, the hearts of those. When God the generous, the, merci- the most gracious is mentioned, the hearts of those. So it does not, but when God alone is mentioned, the hearts of those. Because when God the most merciful is mentioned, even the idol worshippers don't mind it. But when God alone is mentioned, <coughs> they, they become disturbed. The next page are the contents. And we have the surah number, the name of the surah in English and in Arabic. And then the number of verses for those who will do research. There's a lot of mathematical uh, structure, pure mathematical structure. That is, uh, as you will read in the appendices, based on the number of verses and the numbers of surahs. It has nothing to do with the literary composition. And then there's a glossary for people who are not familiar with uh, Median or Hijra calendar, things like that. And then you, you can continue to flip the pages until you see on the seventh, on the 27th night of Ramadan. We had this in the other translation, but uh, there is there is more more knowledge. We we learned a few things since nine years ago, when the first translation was written, and you will see it reflected almost in every page here. This page says on the 27th night of Ramadan of the year 13 before Hijra, 610 A.D., the Prophet Muhammad was summoned to the highest possible point millions of light years from the planet Earth, and this Qur'an was placed into his heart. We have the verses. Subsequently, the Qur'an was released into Muhammad's memory with Gabriel's mediation over a period of 23 years, from 610 to 632 A.D. And we have the verse. At the moment of release, Muhammad scrupulously wrote it down with his own hand. It has been divinely guarded since then. See Appendices 1 and 28. So you can see... The changes, they are big changes, but they are subtle. Now, in the, even in the first translation, there was no mistake, because what I wrote in the first translation was, at the moment of release, it was scrupulously written down, and divinely got it since then. <laughs> so that was uh, good luck. <laughs> even though I was trapped in the, what they taught us then, that Muhammad was an illiterate man who couldn't read or write. And now we know better. We have evidence now that he wrote it with his own hand, and the copy that he wrote in the chronological sequence of writing was destroyed by the people who, uh, who, who uh, added two false statements at the end of Surah 9. Was, uh, they won the war, they think. Now we read the introduction, I want to read it fast with you. This is God's final message to humanity. All of God's prophets have come to this world and all the scriptures have been delivered. The time has come to purify and consolidate all the messages delivered by God's prophets into one message and proclaim that henceforth only one religion is acceptable to God, submission. Islam is not the name of a religion, it is a description. Islam is the total submission and devotion to God alone. Thus there are many Muslim Christians, Muslim Jews and Muslim Muslims, I have met some of them. There is only one religion, devoting one's worship to God alone. This is the first commandment in the Old Testament, the New Testament, and this final testament. Now that the message is complete, we have received such crucial information as the purpose of our life, how we came into this world, and where we are going. One may ask, why did God wait all this time to perfect and consolidate his message? What about all those people since Adam who did not receive the complete scripture? To put these questions in the right perspective, let us look at the world population from Adam to the end of the world. It is a matter of simple statistics that the world's population from the beginning until now did not exceed 6 billion. From now to the end of the world, reported here as 2280 AD, see Appendix 25, it is estimated that the world population will exceed 75 billion. In other words, the vast majority of people are yet to come to this world. God's purified and consolidated message, therefore, is destined to reach the vast majority of humans. Just think, in about 20 years, in 20 years from now, there will be twice the population of Earth, of people on Earth. Now, these are twice the population of the present population, 
who never heard about Jesus being son of God or God or Trinity. They're coming into this world for a fresh start. They never heard all this uh, nonsense of the corrupted religions, Islam, Christianity, Judaism. But they will get the one unified message, inshaAllah. You see here the graph showing world population from now, 1989, to the end of the world, 2280. And the black box represents the world population since Adam until now. So this is the question that you you already been asked, <laughs> and you will be asked: What about all those people? Are they wrong? What happens to them? The same question was asked of Moses. Remember, Pharaoh said, "What about all those people in the past? Why are you coming to tell us about God this and that?" And uh, Moses said the right answer: which the, the, Their matter is with God. That is the Yeah, <laughs> that's their business. It all began a few billion years ago when one of God's high-ranking creatures, Satan, developed supercilious thoughts that he could be a god besides God. This challenge to God's absolute authority was not only blasphemous, it was totally erroneous. Satan was ignorant of the fact that God alone possesses the power and qualification to be a god, and that there is much more to godhood than he could have ever imagined. It was ignorance coupled with pride that led Satan to believe that he could take care of a dominion as a god and run it efficiently without disease, misery, war, accidents, and chaos. While Satan was the initiator of this horrendous blasphemy, billions of creatures agreed with Satan. They decided that Satan's God-given powers did qualify him to be a god in his own right. Thus, a profound dispute erupted within the heavenly society, as we see in Surah 38, verse 69. <coughs> The rebels' unjustifiable challenge to God's absolute authority was met and resolved in the most efficient manner. <coughs> if you claim that you can fly a plane, the best way to test your claim is to give you a plane and ask you to fly it. This is precisely what God decided to do in response to Satan's claim that he could be a god. As for those who agreed with Satan, they were given a chance to reconsider their decisions and accept God's absolute authority or go through a test where they witness Satan's attempt to prove his abilities as a god. About 100 billion creatures chose to participate in Satan's demonstration. 3372. Now please excuse me and bear with me for reading like this. It's rather boring when you read from a book, but this is very important. And I think you agree with me. It's very important to understand the introduction and the reason for us being here. <coughs> the heavenly dispute led to the classification of God's creatures into three different categories. Number one, angels, creatures who never questioned God's absolute authority. They knew that God alone possessed the power to be a God. Number two, jinns, the creatures who decided that Satan was capable of being a God. Number three, you and I, creatures who remain neutral. They questioned God's absolute authority. These creatures believed that Satan might possess sufficient power to run a dominion. You and I said, hmm, that's an interesting choice. Let's, you know, let's have a demonstration. Maybe you can do it. But by doing so, we questioned God's absolute authority. We did not make a firm stand. And if, if Rachel lets me continue, I <laughs> Rachel is the noisy kid right here. It is the parents' responsibility but to keep the kids quiet. So we're going to be banished if we keep her quiet. Did I welcome Feroz and Betul Kermali and Gail Cunningham and Movel Tate to our meeting tonight? I'm sorry, but uh, you'll meet them and love them for, until the conference is over. Now this is uh, one, two, the third paragraph of page uh, XIV. <coughs> it, is <laughs> it is only logical that members of God's kingdom must uphold God's absolute authority. The angels, therefore, expected Satan and those who agreed with him to be banished from God's kingdom. Exiled from God means hell. When God informed the angels that he was placing Satan as a god on earth and granting the creatures who agreed with him another chance to be redeemed, the angels wondered, would you place on earth those who would commit evil therein and shed blood? Surah 2 verse 30. God, the most gracious, most merciful, will that we get another chance to denounce our blasphemy and redeem ourselves by deciding that God alone possesses all power. 
This is why you see that great criterion at the beginning of this book. To carry out the projected test, God created death. Surah 67, verses 1 and 2. The divine plan called for putting the rebellious creatures to death, then bringing them into another life, this worldly dimension, where they have no recollection of the heavenly feud. Under the circumstances of this life, the humans and the gents are given absolute freedom to reconsider their blasphemous ideas after studying God's messages and Satan's messages. Based on their free will decision, they are either redeemed into God's kingdom or remain exiled with Satan. As you see, the introduction is important, but if you are like me, I don't need the introduction.
They did stay there. You don't know how, how many millions of years Adam and Eve stayed there. They did stay there for as long as they followed God's law, which is abstention from that forbidden tree. Uh, forbidden tree is a symbolic, allegorical idea. All the human beings, they already committed the, that crime, uh, came down here. But uh, Adam and Eve were the first human beings. And uh, I guess uh, in that sense they represented all of us. Yeah. Represented all of us, and they, uh, when they ate from the tree, uh, they represented our tendencies. In other words, every other human being, if left in heaven long enough, he or she would end up listening to Satan's message and would go down. So they have all this time and send them all down to us. Have them, let them take the test and redeem themselves if they are going to be. Then I had the uh, point first. Huh? Maybe. Why was he the first one? You know, that's a possibility. Remember, Adam was a prophet also. Adam was, was Adam was redeemed, he repented, and he was a he was the first prophet. He had to be because he had to give the message to his children and grandchildren, and great children, and great 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 grandchildren. They lived the long, they lived a long time those days. No, Abraham's scripture was all practical. Was the prayers, the fasting, the hat, the zakat. There was no writing or reading at the time of Abraham. Unless you want to carry two tons of rocks. <laughs> <laughs> you see, we're laughing. Fifty years to be laughing at us for reading a book like this. And we can't be laughing at the time of Abraham that you have to carry tons of rocks to read. Yes, go ahead. Adam also got a scripture instead of practice. Uh-huh, yes, yes. He had a scripture, and the scripture was to tell his children about God and uh, what it is all about. You must worship God alone and not listen to Satan. I've been bitten. Don't listen to Satan. <laughs> I made a mistake. That was his message. Oh, well. It's more ignorance, not arrogance. It's more ignorance. The original sin, uh, Mobile, is not uh, what most people think, which is eating from the tree. It's what most people think. The original sin was billions of years before eating from the tree. It was when uh, we did not make a firm stand with God, absolute authority. When Satan proclaimed that he can be a God and he's right, we said, hmm, that's an interesting idea, let us see. That was dumb. The gents, <laughs> the gents were even more stupid. You know, they said, yeah, you can do it. <laughs> the angels said, no way. That's not the majority. The angels were the, the vast majority, by the way. But the gents and the humans represent the criminal element in the heavenly society. <laughs> That's why we're, we're in this prison. 
the body, the physical. <laughs> so the original sin, uh, you know more than anybody in the whole world now, that the original sin was billions of years before Jesus came to the sea. But let's just go back. Okay? Yes, this is exactly what it says in 3372. It says the human being was ignorant and the most accurate would be stupid <laughs> in choosing. Because that was another chance for us to be redeemed. God said, Do you want to submit to my absolute authority or do you want to have a freedom of choice between my message and Satan's message? <laughs> Damn. <laughs> we are done. Okay, this is now uh, paragraph 3, page XB. Putting Satan, the gins, and the humans to the test stipulated that Satan shall reproduce whenever a human being is born. Every time a human being is born, a gin is born to be the new human's constant companion. The human person is subjected to the incessant persuasions of Satan's representative who lives in the same body from birth to death. Satan's representative tries to convince the human companion of Satan's point of view that God alone is not enough. On the day of judgment, the companion serves as a witness for or against the human. So, we are all schizophrenic. <laughs> <laughs> There's another creature in your body. That other creature is telling you God alone is not enough. And you are trying to convince that other creature, who is Satan's descendant, that uh, God alone is enough. <laughs> and Allah. Yes. Yes, it's a very good point. Do you understand what Abdullah is saying? Yes, the, 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 Abdullah is saying that this means that exactly half were, were jinns and half were humans. And this is exactly what happened. Yeah. Well, you can think of it as uh, not a, a, a sharp line. You can take the whole group that did not make a firm stand with God's absolute authority, and the one who was the strongest thought, Satan, this half became jinn. The half that was less strong were, were the humans. So God did divide this in half. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Yes. Well, of course, this this is the whole this is the whole circumstances that go with assigning you to this. Why are you in this mass listening to this? God assigned you to this time in history, so you listen to this because you deserve this. Because God knows in advance which souls are good, which souls are bad. We are not here for the benefit of God to know who's what. You know, God already knows. We are here for our own benefit to be redeemed, and God knows what was in our hearts and how strongly we were with or against Satan. And on that basis, He assigns babies to your house or somebody else to your neighbor's house. Right. And why do you decide the human body? Right. It has a chance to either get converted or convert the human being. Yes. So at that time, the gent doesn't have all the power, right? Because once right. the human dies, the gent will power the gent. Right. Doesn't gent also still have the freedom of my genetic yes. genetic yes. genetic 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 more chances to see the universe. They fly in this universe and they see stars and things uh, more than uh, human. So God is being very, very, very fair. God is the most gracious, most merciful. We were considerably on God's side, I mean relatively. And they were considerably on Satan's side. So God, when they go to hell, they will really deserve it. And when the humans go to hell, they really deserve it. As you see, we witnessed many of them working very hard, <laughs> jumping the fences to go to hell. 
consider their decisions. Every person is born with instinctive knowledge that God alone and no one else is our Lord and Master. Surah 7 verses 172 and 173. Additionally, God sent messengers to deliver messages, warnings, and abundant information to help us redeem ourselves. With all these elements in view, we can appreciate the fact that the only unforgivable offense if maintained until death, is idol worship, believing that anyone besides God possesses any power. All those people who thanked St. Jude in the newspaper for the success of the operation, even though St. Jude never went to medical school, they, you can see that they are idol worshippers. I thought Marif was asking a question. You be careful to scratch your nose, because you may have to ask a question. <laughs> Paragraph 5, the human being is given 40 years to study, look around, reflect, and examine all points of view before making this most important decision, to uphold Satan's point of view or uphold God's absolute authority. Anyone who dies before the age of 40 is chosen by God for redemption due to circumstances known only to God. If one decides at a young age that God alone possesses all power, then dies before the age of 40, the most probable destiny is the high heaven. Otherwise, the lower heaven is the destiny for most people who die before 40. Appendix 5. As you know, Martin Luther King was taken two months before his 40th birthday. God knew. And uh, his grave uh, stone says, Thank God Almighty, free at last. He didn't say, Thank Jesus, that like that. Malcolm X, who discovered that true Islam, also was taken two months before his 40th birthday. Hugh and Newton, who lived in crime and drugs, Alcohol, violence, died, he was 47. 47, 49, 47. So you can see, I mean, we see in our lives <coughs> all these examples of good people. <coughs> uh, yes, go ahead. What uh, is, we have some here, Yes. Solar. Solar. You see, uh, it is customary in the whole world when you uh, when you say you're 40 years old, you go by the solar system, and this is universal in the whole world, which means this is what God, this is how God wants us to calculate our age. And God says in the verse, uh, when he reaches or when she reaches 40 years of age, he or she must make that decision. So God left it like this, and we all say, uh, I am this or that age based on the solar. Year. Uh, well, thank God because we'll be all older if we use them. Junior, junior year. Yes. Uh, the Quran gives priority to solar years. Yes. God says 300 years and they added nine. Nine years. Also, God mentions the, 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 the word day is mentioned in the Quran 365 days, uh, time, which is the solar, solar year. Solar year is more constant. The sun will, will rise today. Uh, sunrise is what? July. We're gonna, we're gonna look up the sunrise on uh, August uh, 25. Sunrise is 25. 5:54. See, not 5:55. 5:54. August 25. A hundred years from now, the sun will rise at 5:54 in Tucson, Arizona. So, but the moon is kind of crazy. <laughs> it, it has a very a very accurate system also. I mean, we can give you the moon rise a hundred years from now, at exactly the moment. But uh, it is it has an irregular, irregular, accurate system. <laughs> you can accept that. So, the 40 years of uh, solar years. Uh, remember, uh, we had um, many signs about this age of 40, which was very difficult for many people to accept. And thank God for uh, Emily's uh, vision. We're... Uh, we had a very accurate, we knew it was the solar, not the lunar year. That was uh, the, the biggest, was the, one of the biggest signs that we had. 
The next paragraph, God's messengers delivered God's good news to our new, of our new chance to redeem ourselves, as well as warnings to every corner of the globe. They were supported by formidable signs. When Moses went to Pharaoh, he was supported by such miracles as the turning of his staff into a serpent. Jesus created live birds from clay by God's leave, healed the leprous and the blind by God's leave, and revived the dead by God's leave. The Prophet Muhammad, God's messenger, who delivered this final testament, did not exhibit such miracles. We learn from the Quran that the Quran itself suffices as a miracle supporting Muhammad's mission. We have the verses here. It was divine wisdom that separated the miracle of the Quran from Muhammad by 14 centuries. Now that we understand the momentous dimensions of the Quran's mathematical miracle, Appendix 1, we realize that millions of people would have worshipped Muhammad as God incarnate if this miracle had also been revealed through him. Next page. With the advent of the computer age, 14 centuries after the revelation of the Quran, we discover that the Quran's mathematical code is indeed one of the greatest miracles, quote-unquote. While the miracles given to the previous messengers <coughs> were limited in time and place, the Quran's miracle is perpetual on Reed Street. No, that was perpetual saving. <laughs> Only a few people witnessed the miracles of Moses and Jesus, but the Quran's miracle can be witnessed by anyone at any time. Furthermore, the Quran's miracle documents and proves all the previous miracles. Now when you read in the miracle that Jesus revived the dead by God's leave, we know this is a proven by physical evidence. Those letters of that statement are mathematically composed beyond the human ability. We know God is saying that, and this proves the miracles of Jesus and Moses, all the other miracles. Next paragraph. To share this awesome miracle with the reader, the word God is printed throughout the English text in this in bold capital letters, and the number of occurrences is shown in the bottom of, at the bottom of every page. Thus, the total occurrence of this most important word is shown at the end of the Quran to be 2698. This total is a multiple of 19, the miracles common denominator. Furthermore, when we add the numbers assigned to the verses, wherever the word God occurs, the total comes to 118123, which is also a multiple of 19. Which brings you back to the point that uh, this uh, book is being rewritten now. Let us open at random. I'm going to open this at random here. Come to page 401. Let's look at page 401. And we'll tell you something about the, uh, the new translation. I'm going to reserve your copy now. Page 401 at the bottom, we see on the left side uh, number 6. And you see in bold letters the word God in bold capital letters six times. On the right side is the total up to this page, 1891. Now, in the new uh, translation, we're going to write also the numbers of verses where the word, the word God appears. We're going to write the number 40, 41, 42, 44, and 45. We're going to add them up and put them at the bottom of the page. <coughs> so every page will have the, the occurrence of the word God and also the total of the verses. And this will add up to the end of the Quran. It's going to be 118123, which is also a multiple of 19. Because this alone proves that this book is from God. It's not a human being that wrote it. We made it up. Nobody's trying to fool us. But uh, even now, you know, this word God by itself proves that this code. We, we happen to be a very, very lucky uh, generation. You know, I shudder to think that we were born 20 years before now. Yeah. With the Prince Swift and the crowd, we didn't know much. The second paragraph, page XBI. To, oh, uh, the third paragraph. This simple physical fact is easily verifiable by the reader and shows the existence of a superhuman system within the Quran. It was far beyond Muhammad the human or any collection of humans at the time of revelation of the Quran to keep track of the word God and the numbers of verses where it occurs. Another quick illustration of the Quran's mathematical composition involves the word Quran. We find that the Qur'an is mentioned 58 times in the Qur'an. However, verse 10, 15 refers to a Qur'an other than this, and therefore cannot be counted. Thus, this Qur'an is mentioned in the Qur'an 57 times, 19 times 3. The surahs where the word Qur'an, in all its grammatical forms, is mentioned are 38, 19 times 2. The sum of numbers assigned to the surahs and verses where the word Qur'an, in all its grammatical forms, occurs 
is uh, 4408 19 times 2 is 2. These are just uh, small examples of the mathematical composition of the Quran. In addition to the Quran's profound mathematical composition, we find a large number of facts which were proven or theorized by modern science many centuries after this, uh, their revelation in the Quran. Here are a few examples of such advanced scientific information. Number one, the earth is egg-shaped. We give the verses. Number two, the earth is not standing still. It moves constantly. Number three, the sun is a source of light while the moon reflects it. All these things were known centuries after the Quran was revealed. Number four, the, the proportion of oxygen diminishes as we climb towards the sky. Number five, the Big Bang theory is confirmed. Number six, the expansion of the universe theory. These are astronomical uh, theories in, the, in sciences. Number seven, the universe started out as a gaseous, uh, gaseous mass. Number eight, evolution is a fact within a given species. Evolution is a divinely guided process. And I'll give the verses. Number nine, uh, the man's seminal fluid decides the baby's gender. This, we knew this only recently. Equally miraculous is the absence of any nonsense from the Quran. This is particularly significant in view of the dominance of ignorance and superstitions at the time of revelation of the Quran. For example, the most respected exegesis among the traditional Muslims is that of Ibn Kathir. In this famous classic reference, we read that the earth was built on top of a giant whale, upon which stands a bull with 40,000 horns carrying the earth. And I give the reference in the Kathir's interpretation of verse 68.1. Actually, they have it here at the University of Arizona. You can find that book there in the Oriental Studies Department. <laughs> in his interpretation of verse 50, verse 1, sorry, uh, verse 51, Ibn Kathir states that the earth is flat, surrounded by a mountain which carries the first sky. Six more earths with six surrounding mountains surround the first earth and carry their respective skies. As recently as 1975, my favorite guy, and in the same location, <laughs> he was the first man to condemn me to death, and I'm thankful for that. I would have been very disturbed if he agreed with me. <laughs> and in the same location where the Quran was revealed, only 14 centuries later, the president of the Islamic University of Medina, Saudi Arabia, Sheikh Abdul Aziz bin Baz, declared that the earth is flat and standing still is the insert from his book. His book entitled The Evidence That the Earth is uh, Standing Still is replete with unbelievable nonsense. The translation of his, uh, his statement, if the earth is rotating as they claim, the countries, the mountains, the trees, the rivers, and the oceans will have no bottom. And the people will, will witness the western countries move to the east, and the eastern countries move to the west, and the direction of Tibla, the direction of prayer, would have changed. <laughs> 1975, folks. Yes. Oh, his, his titles are unbelievable. One of his titles is uh, President of the Research, uh, Scientific Research, <laughs> and, and some, a very long title. Since the Quran is God's final message to the world, 3340, it consummates the previous scriptures, confirms them, and, and uh, supersedes them. Specific details of the law, the exact purpose of our lives, and the end of the world are all given in the Quran. One of the most elusive objectives of every human being is happiness. The Quran reveals the secret of attaining perfect happiness in this life and forever. We learn from the Quran that happiness is an exclusive quality of the soul. Thus, a body that attains all the material successes it longs for, money, power, fame, good looks, carnal satisfaction, often belongs to an unhappy person. Happiness depends totally on the degree of growth and development attained by the soul, the real person. The Quran provides a detailed map towards perfect happiness for both body and soul, both in this world and in the eternal hereafter. As expected from the Creator's final message, one of the prominent themes in the Quran is the call for unity among all believers and the repeated prohibition of making any distinction among God's messengers. If the object of worship is one and the same, there will be absolute unity among all believers. It is the human factor 
that is devotion to such powerless humans as Jesus, Muhammad, and the saints that causes division, hatred, and bitter wars among the misguided believers. A guided believer is devoted to God alone and rejoices in seeing any other believer who is devoted to God alone, regardless of the name such a believer calls his or her religion. As detailed in Appendix 2, the publication of this book marks the advent of a new era, the era where God's messages, delivered by all his prophets, are consolidated into one. God's one and only religion, submission, shall dominate all other religions. 933, 4828, 619. Today's corrupted religions, including Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, will simply die out, and the true Islam, submission, will prevail. This is not wishful thinking, this is God's inviolable law, as decreed in 319, 4153, and Surah 110. Surely those who are Jewish, the Christians, and the converts, anyone who believes in God, believes in the, in the last day, and leads a righteous life, will receive the recompense from the Lord, they have nothing to fear, nor will they grieve. And this was completed on the, the 26th day of the ninth month of 1409, which Adib gave in the khutbah today. You add these numbers and you get 1444, 19 times 76, or 19 times 19 times 4. And I will stop here so Linda can begin with Surah Al Fatiha two weeks from now, inshallah. If you have any questions, you can. That's the introduction, and uh, you can see it is very concentrated. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> well, Alhamdulillah. I'm going to read the Fatiha for all of us. <clears throat> it's a Fatiha of thanks to God for guiding us. And I'm going to keep this Fatiha all by itself. There will be other Fatihas. We pray to God for, for other things. But I want this one, just a prayer of thanks to God for, for uh, selecting us, as he says in Surah 22, verse 78, for guiding us. And we pray that he keeps us on his path. Al-Fatiha. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين. Remember the first date of the 25th. Whose birthday is not the 25th? Thirtieth August thirtieth. In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful, praise be to God, Lord of the universe, most gracious, most merciful, Master of the day of judgment, only you we worship, only you we ask for help. Guide us in the right path, the path of those whom you bless, not of those who have deserved wrath nor the strength. <laughs> Okay, the footnotes down here, 1-1. One, one. This verse, known as the Basma, occupies a special position in the Quran. It is the opening statement of every surah, except Surah 9, and it, it constitutes the foundation upon which the Quran's 19 based mathematical miracle is built. This is from the next one. The Basma consists of 19 Arabic letters, and it, it's a um, constituent words, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar Occupy in the Quran in multiples of 19, 19, 26, 98, 57, and 114 times. Respectively. Thus, the reader is handed out the outset, handed the outset, tangible proof that this is not a human made book. Numerous mathematical phenomena are connected with this verse. For example, the absence of Basala was compensated for, for 19 surahs later. Surah 27 contains two basmalas, see Appendix 29 and footnote 2730. Thus, the count of all basmalas is restored to 114, 19 times 6. Additionally, when we add the surah numbers from the missing basmala, surah 9, to the extra basmala, surah 27, 9 plus 10 plus 11 plus 20 plus 27, the total comes to 342, 19 times 8. This total, remarkably, is also the number of words between the two basmalas of Surah 27. 
as detailed in Appendix 1, the Franz mathematical code is so vast and so intricate that no force on Earth could possibly imitate it, let alone manufacture it. 1780. Well, the beginning, the first verse starts out like we should start everything in the name of God. Gracious and merciful. And goes on, faith be to God, Lord of the universe. Lord of the universe, almost defining God. I mean, it's like very definite. This is God, Lord of the universe. The messengers come saying that they're, they've come messengers from the Lord of the universe. They praise the Lord of the universe that they're, um, their, um, provisions. their provisions come from the Lord of the universe. It's very definite that it's Lord of the universe. No other God, Lord of the universe. Lord of totally everything. And um, goes back to most gracious, most merciful, master of the judgment, that only God we worship and only God we ask for help. There's no intercession. You don't have to go through ads in this newspaper. Thank you. And um, now these people are so proud to put ads for St. Jude. They never put their names. They put their initials only. This is how proud they are to do what they're doing. And um, goes on to guide us in the right path. And in Surah 5, verse 16, it um, describes the path. With it, God guides those who seek his approval. He guides them to the path of peace, leads them out of darkness into the light by his lead, and guides them in a straight path. The path of those whom you bless, not of those who have deserved wrath nor the strays. Now, some of the things to incur wrath include in um, Surah 16, verse 106. Those who disbelieve in God, after having acquired faith and become fully content with disbelief, have incurred wrath from God. The only ones to be excused are those who are forced to profess disbelief while their hearts are full of faith. Also, in verse, um, chapter 2, verse 61, they were condemned to humiliation and disgrace, and they incurred God's wrath. That is because they used to disbelieve in God's revelation and kill the prophets unjustly. That is because they disobeyed, disobeyed and transgressed. Also, in verse 15 of chapter 178, O oh, you who believe, if you encounter the disbelievers who have mobilized against you, do not turn back and flee. And verse 16 goes on, Anyone who turns back on that day except to carry out a battle plan or to join his group, his group has incurred wrath from God, and his, his abode is hell, but a miserable destiny. And also by idolizing, you incur God's wrath, as stated in chapter t- uh, 7, verse 152. Surely those who idolize the calf have incurred wrath from their Lord and humiliation in this life. We thus require the innovate. And um, we know the destiny for those who incur God's wrath is hell, as stated in chapter 3, verse 162. It's one who seeks God's approval, the same as one who incurs wrath from God, and his destiny is hell and a miserable world. Now for the strayers, Strayers follow Satan, as stated in chapter 15, verse 42. You have no power over my servants except the strayers who follow you. In chapter 4, verse 136, it states, O you who believe, you shall believe in God and his messenger. Not just in God, but his messenger. And the scripture he has revealed through his messenger. And that the scripture he has revealed before them. Anyone who disbelieves in God and his angels and his scriptures and his messenger and the last day has indeed strayed far astray. And it's not only believing in his messenger. It goes on in chapter 5, verse 12. God has taken covenant from the children of Israel and we raised among the twelve patriarchs. And God said, I am with you, so as long as you observe the contact prayer and give the obligatory charity and believe in my messenger, and respect them, respect the message, and continue to lend God a loan of righteousness, I will then remit your sins and admit you into gardens with flowing streams. Anyone who disbelieves after this has indeed strayed off the right path. And respecting the messenger, well, you lower your voice as the messenger. You um, follow the messenger, and um, 
in verse 2278. Thus the messenger shall, shall, shall serve. I'm nervous. My heart's beating. Like crazy. Oh, <laughs> 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 will benefit. The reverend will take heed, the wicked will avoid. So the messenger, he has to remind, and he, we have to follow him. And it, it's funny how, it's just like, I know I've told the example to my friend, about um, following the path and reminded to follow the path. It's just like <clears throat> when you're on vacation, I don't know, bring my sense the husband drives and the mother sits with the map, you know, and she controls the map and she's telling the husband, you know, well, honey, I really don't think you're going in the right direction, you know, I think you're off of the path. Invariably, the man says, I know where I'm going, give me that map, I don't need that map. <laughs> and it's just like, I mean, it's no doubt that as believers, when we're told, oh, excuse me, I think you're kind of going off of the path, and we're like, no, I'm not, I know where I'm going, and we go around in circles and go around in circles, like my <laughs> we waste a lot of time and energy, and if we would just respect the messenger, the messenger, I mean, he has his job to do, and we have our job to do, and, and do it together. Okay, so, anyway, it goes on about the strayer, chapter 2, verse 108. Do you wish to demand of your messenger what was demanded of Moses before? Anyone who substitutes disbelief for belief has strayed off the right path. We know what happens to the strayers because in chapter 3, verse 90, it states, Surely those who disbelieve after believing then plunge deeper into disbelief, their repentance will not be accepted from them. These are the strayers. This is 
in their privacy, observe the contact prayers to the flock, and from our provisions to them they give to charity, and they believe in what was revealed to you and in what was revealed before you. With regard to the hereafter, they are certain. These are guided by their Lord. These are the winners. Go on to chapter 8, verse 2. It describes the believers more, the righteous more. The true believers are those whose hearts tremble when God is mentioned and when his, when his revelations are recited to them. Their faith is strengthened and they trust in their Lord. They observe the contact prayers and from our provisions to them they give. Such are the true believers. They attain high ranks at their Lord, as well as forgiveness and a generous reason. And um, in chapter 9, verse 111, 112 states, God has brought them, <coughs> brought from the believers, bought from their believers, their lives, <coughs> their money in exchange for paradise. Thus they fight in the cause of God, willing to kill and get killed. Such is his truthful pledge in the Torah, the Gospel, and the Quran, and who fulfills his pledge better than God. You shall rejoice in making such an exchange. This is the greatest triumph. They are the repenters, worshippers, praisers, mediators, bowing and prostrating, advocators of righteousness and forbidders of evil, and keepers of God's law. Give good news to such believers. And also, there are three verse 171 through 173 states, they have good news of God's blessings and grace, and that, that God never fails to reward the believers. But those who respond to God and the messenger, despite all kinds of hardship and lead a righteous life, a great reward. When the people say to them, people have mobilized against you, you shall fear them. This only strengthens their faith, and they say, God suffices us. He is the best protector. It seems to be something that distinguishes the, the righteous believers from the disbelievers and hypocrites, that the righteous are more than willing to, um, to defend their belief in God, that they don't turn back, that they um, stand strong, because they have nothing to fear. If they're, the only thing they fear is God, and if they're defending their belief of God, they have nothing to fear. As for those who disbelieve, it is the same for them. Whether you warn them or not warn them, they cannot believe. God has sealed their hearts and their hearing, and their eyes are veiled. They have incurred severe retribution. In uh, Surah 68, the disbelievers are referred to as compromisers, lowly swearers, slanderers, backbiters, forbidders of charity, transgressors, sinners, unappreciative, and greedy. Questions, comments? Compromisers, lowly swearers, slander, backbiter, forbidder of charity, transgressors, sinners, unappreciative, and greedy. God mocks them by leaving them in their transgressions, blunders. 
It is they who fought the strain at the expense of guidance. Such trade never prospers, nor do they receive any guidance. Their example is like those who start a fire, then as it begins to shed light for them, God takes away their light, leaving them in darkness, unable to see. Deaf, dumb, and blind, they fail to return. Or like a storm from the sky, with darkness, thunder, and lightning, they put their fingers in their ears to bathe the lightning bolt, and death, God thus surrounds the disbelief. In a Surah 3, verse 167, the hypocrites are mentioned by um, state and to expose the hypocrites who were told come in, come fight in the cause of God or con contribute they said if we knew how to fight we would have followed you they were closer to disbelief than belief on that day they uttered with their mouths what was not in their hearts God knows whatever they can feel and then again the, the, the hypocrites they they don't stand firm, strong in their belief. They're they're not willing to fight. And also, um, in 63 verse one, not only it's also um, <clears throat> not only that they they say that they believe God, but they also in this when the hypocrites come to you, they say, We bear witness that you are the messenger of God. God knows that you are the mess his messenger, and God bears witness that the hypocrites are lost. They also say, We know you're the messenger, but they don't believe. Comments, questions? The 